Good morning. Let me welcome you all to CGD. And uh, a little rainy morning, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and let me uh, also welcome back Minister Bibo, Mike Claude Bibo, who was here a few months ago uh, talking about the agenda for uh, Canada's development policy under her leadership. And uh, today she's here to talk about uh, an initiative which uh, used to happen and stopped happening about uh, eight years ago, which was that under the G7 presidency, normally all the development ministers would get together. And the last time they did that was in 2010, uh, which was also under Canada's leadership. So I'm very glad that uh, uh, Canada has reinstated uh, that uh, tradition now. And that meeting is going to happen in about 10 days. And uh, what uh, Michael Bibo has uh, very kindly offered to do today is to give us a little bit of her preview, her vision of uh, what the agenda for the development uh, ministers, officials uh, should be going forward this year and, and under Canada's uh, leadership. And uh, then we'll have a conversation. We'll talk a bit about it. And then I'd really like all of you uh, to not just ask questions, but I'm sure you all have uh, issues that you want to put on the development agenda this year for Canada. And I can assure you that she comes well equipped with a couple of colleagues who are sitting with notepads <laughs> to take note of all of the valuable suggestions that you will make. So the way we're going to do it is uh, ask Minister Bibo to take a few minutes uh, to just lay out uh, her vision and then uh, we'll sit down and have a conversation. So welcome again, Madam Minister. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you once again. As you can imagine, excitement about the G7 is building right now in Canada. And since, since our government highly values the work and perspectives of the Center for Global Development, I think that our discussion today is timely. We are now three years into Agenda 2030. We need fresh thinking and an accelerated approach to step up and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Canada has clearly positioned itself as a feminist government over the last two years. We have insisted on SDG 5, gender equality, as the cornerstone to eradicate poverty. We've put women and girls at the center of our feminist international assistance policy. We've put forward progressive trade and foreign policies that aim to tear down barriers to women's empowerment. We've worked to give women more significant roles in peace building. And we are glad to see that since the SDGs, the fight for gender equality has picked up speed support and credibility through various international fora. Along the way, the fight to end harassment, sexual exploitation and abuse of power has gained widespread acceptance through social movements like hashtag MeToo and hashtag, hashtag Time's Up. But we need to remember one undeniable fact about women empowerment. It needs to start early. And it needs to start with those who are the most excluded. Adolescent girls are among, among the most excluded people on the planet. And as a result, their needs are largely unmet. We know our, how crucial the teenage years are. What happens to a girl at that age can fundamentally change the course of her life. And unfortunately, Evidence shows that adolescent girls, especially those living in poor and unstable regions, face systemic challenges to realizing their human rights. In many societies, they still have more limited access to education and healthcare than boys. 
they have more domestic responsibilities and fewer opportunities to work or earn a good wage. Also, too many adolescent girls have limited or no control over their own bodies and reprodu reproductive choices. Every year, 16 million children are born to adolescent girls. This is slightly more than one out of every 10 births worldwide. Early pregnancy obviously makes it harder for girls to stay in school and harder for them to work. And so do many deep-rooted social norms, stereotypes, perceptions, and customs that perpetuate gender inequality and poverty. Like child early enforced marriage, each year, as a result of this practice, 12 million girls are married before the age of 18. Not to mention discriminatory laws that limit women and girls' social and economic freedom in more than 150 countries around the world. In fact, adolescent girls face discrimination because of age and gender, making them bear the brunt of poverty and violence. This is especially true in countries affected by fragility and conflict. As you know, women and girls who live in such contexts face increased risks of gross humanitarian rights violations and abuses, especially sexual and gender-based violence, with devastating consequences for adolescent girls. Right now, according to the World Bank, some 2 billion people, or nearly 30% of the world's population, live in regions affected by fragility and conflict. Among them are an unprecedented number of young people under 30. And according to the, Wealth El the World Health Organization, there are 26 million women and girls of reproductive age living in emergency situations. So, at this point of time, in time, it is clearly that we need to empower adolescent girls, especially in humanitarian and fragile settings. As global influencers and leaders, we need to start thinking about gender equality in terms of supporting women and girls throughout their life cycle, from birth to older, older years. And more than ever, we need to turn our attention towards adolescent girls, because they are both the most vulnerable and the most powerful population to drive progress on the SDGs. When their needs are addressed and their rights are respected, they can transform their own lives, their families, and their countries. Over the last year, Canada has taken a number of key steps to advance women and girls' empowerment. We have made adolescent girls and women's education and vocational training a development priority to help them take advantage of economic opportunities. In March 2017, we made a three-year commitment to improve women and girls' access to sexual and reproductive health services in the developing world. This is one of our main priorities under Canada's new feminist international assistance policy. And it is crucial, as complications from pregnancy and childbirth are the second leading cause of death in girls between 15 and 19 years old. We want women and girls to be empowered to make informed choices, avoid early pregnancies, live free from violence and harmful practices, and realize their ambitions. In June 2017, Canada launched its new Women's Voice and Leadership Program in support of women's rights organizations and movements that promote gender equality and advance the rights of women and girls. <coughs> they are in the best position to challenge gender power dynamics and propel systemic change. I also want to mention that Canadian civil society organizations have taken leadership action on adolescent health. Last May, the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, or Can Watch, hosted an international conference in Ottawa on global adolescent health. This conference started a global movement on adolescents. Every Woman, Every Child launched its global acceleration action for the health of adolescents. The Lancet published a series on adolescent health. 
and a Global Advocacy for Change for Adolescents Toolkit was developed by Women Deliver, The Who, and the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health. As part of Canada's effort to support gender equality, we have also made our humanitarian assistance more gender responsive. As I mentioned earlier, women and girls in humanitarian settings clearly need adequate health services and psychosocial support, in addition to, wood, in addition to water, food, and shelter. To ensure that specific needs are met, we ask our partners to make sure women and girls have a voice throughout our humanitarian response. We have increased our targeted support for sexual and reproductive health and rights and against gender-based violence from 16 million to more than 47 million in the last three years. This funding has translated into a more gender-sensitive response to situations like the Rohingya crisis. During my visit in, to Bangladesh last November, I met with Rohingya women seeking refuge in Cox's Bazar, now the largest refugee camp in the world. They were traumatized by the horrors they suffered and exhausted by their long walk to escape the violence in Myanmar. Many of them were survivors of sexual violence and new mothers struggling to find the health services they desperately need. By funding family planning services, psychosocial support, and the creation of safe spaces for women through partners like UNFPA, Canada is filling important gaps. Last November, there were only two specialized, specialized centers to help survivors of sexual abuse. So, Canada decided to directly fund the creation of 20 more and our action helped to mobilize more support within the international community. Today, there are a total of 39 such centers in Cogs Bazaar, and we hope to see this progress continue. Canada is also increasing its advocacy. On one front, promoting gender equality in humanitarian settings remain insufficiently prioritized, partly because there is little accountability for failure to do so but also because we lack consistent commitment and leadership, including in the field, to support the actions required for change. So, over the next year, Canada will be championing gender-responsive humanitarian action in international fora. We need visible advocates to be united and push for system-wide change. We need better data, better programming, better monitoring mechanisms to ensure we can see progress. We need to better support the participation and leadership of women and girls, including through local women's organizations. Canada will also continue working on other fronts to advance gender equality. We are determined to use Canada's seat on the UN Commission of the status, on the Status of Women and the UN Commission on Population and Development to that end. This fall, Canada will once again co-lead a resolution at the United Nations on ending child early and forced marriage. And we want to mobilize new partners in women and girls empowerment as host of the Women Deliver Conference next year. Today, I'm proud to tell you that Canada is going one step further by making adolescent girls the main theme of the G7 Development Ministerial Meeting in Whistler, British Columbia, later this month. We want to boost momentum on gender equality issues and build consensus among G7 leaders so that policies are translated into resources and then into programming. Traditionally, G7 initiatives have placed particular issues rather than people at the center of their efforts. We will do things differently this time. We will make adolescent girls at the heart of all discussions. We will explore a holistic approach to girls' empowerment and discuss, discuss key aspects of it, from advancing their education and leadership in times of conflict and crisis, to addressing barriers to the full enjoyment of their human rights, to driving gender-responsive approaches to humanitarian assistance. I'm also proud to point out that we are actually giving adolescent girls a voice at the G7. Six young women leaders from different regions of the world 
will speak to their experiences of adolescence and to the barriers they face in realizing their rights and ambitions. We are taking this holistic approach to the G7 because a girl's life cannot be divided into silos. We need to come up with girl-centered solutions that work across sectors and that include the participation of girls. This is how we will find ways to support positive change and to unlock the power of a whole generation. Some of our discussions in Whistler will be live streamed, so I invite all of you to follow us. But more immediately, I look forward to hearing your thoughts today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Bibo, for giving us your very clear vision now of what it is that you want to promote during the G7 Development Minister's meeting. And you talk about this kind of holistic approach to adolescent girls as being the center around that. I guess my first thought was, you've no doubt in the run-up to this meeting, you and your colleagues have been talking to all the other uh, G7 ministers and, and their uh, colleagues and officials. So how much of a resonance are you getting on this being the centerpiece of the agenda and also in terms of how you think about the, the set of issues? Um, I'll have more to say early June. Yes. <laughs> but for now, no, I think when we talk about women empowerment with the G7 countries, mm. uh, we, we find uh, a lot of um, adhesion uh, ar around this subject. We might be looking at it in, from different perspectives, and maybe uh, some would be more interested in education, others in as Canada in sexual and reproductive health services or so we might have complement complementary uh, views on the subject but the idea is to say okay stop looking at the the at girls and women in silos and sector and we should be more um we should understand better the full life mm. circle and make sure that we take it into consideration throughout our programming. We have to know that the G7 countries represent more than 70% of, of ODA. So if we make some decisions or if we decide to work differently and, and have a more gender responsive approach in our programming, uh, it will make important change in, in, in the impact we may have in the field. So this, this is the start of the discussion. Well, I remember the last time that you had the, when you chaired the, the G7 uh, in Muskoka, Canada made a commitment to uh, maternal and child health, mm -hmm. which was really quite exceptional. I think if I recall right, it was $5 billion in additional funding at the 3. time. 3.5. Yeah. And that was a big number. It's a big legacy. So early June, are you going to give us another... <laughs> uh, Another initiative that will be sort of matching that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the uh, MNCH, the Maternal and mm. Newborn Child uh, Health Initiative of the previous government, obviously we continue uh, to, to uh, this initiative because it wasn't ended, but we, we en enlarged it with our uh, sexual and reproductive health um, commitment. So we, we took the MNCH, which was for five years, only two, uh, already two years were gone, so we added an additional 650 million to make sure that we were not focusing only on safe delivery, but we were really offering throughout through our partners the full range of sexual and reproductive health services from sexual education to boys and girls, family planning, access to contraception, and even safe and uh, safe abortion where, where it's legal. So this is one important commitment we already made. For the G7, um, the discussion we have now um, is more, I mean, we don't want to look only at numbers, uh, obviously, and but we feel that uh, there might be some significant uh, commitment around girls and most probably around education, girls, girls education. I mean, as you say, numbers are only one part of it. It's kind of how you spend it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, 
I mean, you announced, I think, $2 billion uh, in increase in the international assistance mm -hmm. envelope, but it's sort of spread over five years. It kind of barely keeps up with inflation. So, I mean, part of the leadership, I guess, that Canada is now sort of very much on the international development scene will be to see over time how Canada can actually also provide additional support, recognizing I like, I mean, you, like every other G7 country now, faces many different constraints and, and pressures. So I think you'll find in this room lots of people that will be rooting for you and hoping that uh, you know, over the next years to come, we'll be able to see that. Um, can I just come back a bit to the other countries in, in the following sense? So you're in the US now, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, here, the, the administration has had a slight different approach uh, to some dimensions of the agenda, particularly around sexual reproductive health. But there has been uh, quite a lot of support for women's entrepreneurs, women's economic empowerment. How do you, do you see that area of women <coughs> economic empowerment as also being a big part of the agenda going forward? Well, I think we all agree that women empowerment is very important. And if we, ha we want to have empowered women um, as a, a, the best, well, one of the yeah. best at least way to end poverty and achieve the SDGs, we need to have educated girls. We need to give girls and adults and girls the, the capacity to develop their full potential and to contribute fully to the economy. So I think this is the discussion we want to have. So how do we address the full life cycle of a girl, adolescent, and women? Because this, we, we need to take care of the girls and adolescent girls if we want to have empowered women and achieve our objectives. And there are many uh, challenges that these adolescent girls are facing. So how can we make sure that the way we work in the field, we work our, our partner, the way we, we push our partners uh, to, to, be, to have a greater impact, uh, is effective because it's it's not only to take women when they are adult and try to empower them. It's really uh, starting from with the little girls. Uh, do you know Joyce Banda? Um, he's a, been a distinguished uh, fellow here at CGD. Just come out with a little book, and I'll make sure I give you a copy of it before you leave. Which uh, which should any of you are interested should look at, and it, it's actually called uh, The Girl Child, and, and her, all, her whole thesis in that book uh, is partly a sort of personal account of her own life, uh, is that actually it's in the first 14, 15 years mm -hmm. that you sow the seeds of a lot of the inequalities and discrimination between girls and boys that become much harder to correct uh, as you try to address them when they're adults. So it very much speaks to, to this issue that you're raising. And, and uh, I think one of the things that she raised and that you raised was the need to look at the problem as holistically, you know, to look at the, the needs and requirements and priorities for young women and adolescents, uh, and, and even younger girls you know, uh, as a whole. And yet most of our agencies, most of our interventions are in specific areas. So you have people who work on health, you have people who work on reproductive rights, you have people who work on nutrition, you know, and they're all doing great work. But how do you see the challenge now as you know, as a policymaker in Canada, of bringing together even all the Canadian uh, mm -hmm. agencies, let alone the international ones in which you are a shareholder, to think across their own areas and think more holistically? Well, I don't have the answer mm -hmm. yet, and your thoughts will no, be welcome on the subject. The yeah. <laughs> but I think this is exactly the challenge and the discussion we want to have at the G7. We, want, we have to acknowledge the, the, the reality and uh, the, the challenge we are facing. And while we know that some will be working on education in the field, when you're there but you, you are conscious of, of the environment and you are conscious on, on the various needs of a girl and you can make better connection with, with your colleagues, with other partners, could also be much more efficient. So I think that the idea is really first to acknowledge the situation and then to challenge ourselves to be innovative and to um, 
to have financing mechanisms that will facilitate collaboration between uh, different partners and you know to uh, to stop thinking on, only in silos but to facilitate the coordination and integration I'm free to open it up and ask uh, people for their views but I just want to ask one other uh, point sure. I want to raise with you before which is you mentioned before we uh, came to this that you were also uh, part of the meeting was going to be a joint meeting mm -hmm. with the G7 finance ministers. And, and I think that also is a great uh, idea because in many countries, the development agenda is sort of partly handled by the development ministers and, and some of the institutions that deal with development kind of work through the, the finance ministries. And, and uh, many people in this room who've worked in different uh, institutions will, will remember that it's not always the case that you could get a common approach from a country across the different elements. So on the part that you're going to be discussing with finance ministers together, one dimension will no doubt be what we've just been talking about, but is there another agenda also? Are there other issues that you're planning to raise in that discussion? Yeah, I would say there's three subjects that we want to discuss while we, we will have this opportunity to be sitting together. So the first one is women economic empowerment. Yeah. Uh, obviously, so this how to how to support uh, women in, in in business and to facilitate their access to financing and and everything related to uh, to that. Um, the second one is financing development, financing the SDGs. How, how can we bring new partners on board? How can we look at in fin um, development international financing institution differently? So this is really on this. And I just come back from London for the Commonwealth uh, Summit and from the CARICOM as well with the, the, in the Caribbean. And uh, I have to, uh, um, I made a promise and this promise was to make sure that we will have the discussion on small island states and all the challenges they face to finance their particular uh, vulnerable situation uh, when we think about uh, natural disasters. Uh, relation with climate change, um, access to concession, uh, concessional financing, uh, you know, acknowledging the fact that they are particular. When we look at our usual way of considering their eligibility to different financing mechanism based on GDP, uh, while we know that a hurricane can just um, destroy three times their GDP uh, in, in overnight. So how can we look at their particular situation differently in terms of financing? And not only in financing, but also um, everything related to be more resilient and uh, how to, to deal with reconstru reconstruction as well. So we're, we're still you know, kind of reeling. Many of those countries are still reeling from the damage and destruction from last mm -hmm. year's hurricane season. And, and I think you were saying that, you know, we're beginning to see the countdown yeah. to the next uh, hurricane season. And I think that the, the I, I don't think that the international community has yet found a solution to deal with the exceptional but sporadic needs that come for with this uh, natural disasters for these countries. And and I think this is a conversation that if you can advance that, and particularly now using more market mechanisms also mm. for insurance, which uh, is uh, increasingly something that we probably didn't think about 10 years ago, but today, you know, you might be able to, to do, and, and some agencies are doing it. So I think my hat's off to you, and then more power for that agenda as you push mm -hmm. that. Uh, okay, um, I know there are people with many different interests here. So <laughs> we are going to take maybe three or four questions each time and then come back to you, that's all right? Our, our, okay. our comments, or our comments. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't pretend I will Please, be able then, to answer all so, your questions. So, uh, my, my colleague, uh, who used to uh, handle these for us, always used to say that. Please make sure that your intervention ends with a question mark. <laughs> but, but we don't have to do that today. So, so if you have a comment, but as long as you can keep it short, so that we can get more people. So, why do, there are some mics here. So, I'm going to start with this lady here, here, and then here, and then I'll work back. 
Thank you both. Thank you, Minister. If you could identify yourself, that Yes, great. my name is Natalie Eberts, and I'm with the Action Partnership. Uh, and we have one of our partners is Results Canada, actually, um, who I think works with you all. Um, my question is that we understand that, as you mentioned, Canada is leading on education for girls and complex emergencies, and also, um, as you mentioned, like sexual trauma centers that centers that deal with that. And so we're commending that leadership and also wondering how um, Global Health and Nutrition, as a key uh, supporter of the feminist um, international uh, assistance agenda, how that um, might also advance the health and nutrition. So uh, not just the education and emergencies, but also the health and nutrition part and how that comes into the feminist agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So health and nutrition, this lady over here. Great. Well, I'm um, Elizabeth Silva with the Asia Foundation, and I just want to start out by thanking you so much for your for your remarks. Um, Canada's um, feminist international assistance policy is really inspiring, um, and for those of us who work in gender equality, it's just it's a model that we hope other donor countries will follow um, suit. At the Asia Foundation, I work um, on advancing gender equality both programmatically, um, but also institutionally, making sure that we're really advancing um, the organizational culture and capacity of our staff um, to be able to advance women's empowerment and gender equality. And so I'm wondering um, if you can speak a little bit about what Global Affairs Canada is doing in that regard, um, especially um, in light of the Me Too movement. Um, and, um, and then I have one other quick question. I, the focus on adolescent girls is also really expire, inspiring and exciting. Um, I've been a girls' rights advocate for many years. And um, as I know that you're, you're very well aware, girls are not um, advancing in a bubble. They are very much influenced mm -hmm. by their surroundings and, um, and by boys, adolescent boys especially. And so I'm wondering um, you know, if there's any um, specific plans for um, you know, positive masculinities or programming around um, adolescent boy development as well. Thank you very much. And I think this gentleman over here. Thank you so much, Mark Engman, UNICEF USA. We work very closely with our colleagues at UNICEF Canada. Uh, just to focus on education again for a second, it's, you know, education is truly a life-saving intervention for children in crises, particularly girls. And one of the problems has been that in the humanitarian world, it has been one of the least supported sectors. So beyond just a, a sort of a G7 commitment, how do you address this, this overall lack of humanitarian funding for education? Okay, maybe we'll take those three and then. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, how the, the health and nutrition, um, when we look at our feminist policy, we have six uh, different um, area of priorities and one we call uh, humanitarian dignity, human, well, human, human dignity. dignity, thank you, hey, human dignity and it includes humanitarian assistance but as well as the, 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 the pillars of development, education, health and, and nutrition, so this is very important. And I would say that uh, also when we think about um, the agriculture is, is one sector that goes everywhere <laughs> almost. Uh, it has a direct link with, uh, with good nutrition. It has a direct link with, um, uh, with economic development, women in part. So this is a, we, we have a lot of support to uh, women in the agricultural sector. And we can see that this feminist approach really makes a difference when we support women entrepreneurs, women in the agricultural sector uh, differently. So directly providing better food and more, more food and then more revenues. Uh, and one of my the most touching testimony I, or most touching um, discussion I had with a, a woman was in Burkina Faso and she, she benefited from an agricultural project. And she told me that this additional revenue prevented uh, marrying her, her daughter. So that was my, my best, I mean, the reason of this for behind this feminist policy, <laughs> it gave uh, a face and it gave really uh, the, the evidence, uh, not evidence in terms of very statistical, uh, uh, dem but it was very important to me. So health and nutrition uh, remain basic pillars of development, but the way we do it, the way we ask our partners to consult women locally to make sure that women are part of the decisions that 
brings to, to, to the project and the way that we implement projects, taking into consideration that women and girls are not only beneficiaries, but they have to be agents of change is really the way that we, we integrate everything related to nutrition in, in, the, in the feminist policy. Uh, Elizabeth, you, you start talking about the expertise on, on gender. And actually, uh, before all our gender specialists dies uh, <laughs> within the department because we are asking so much. They were very excited in the beginning, but I mean that I've been a, I've put quite a bit of pressure on them. So I think the idea is really to um, to bring almost all our part uh, all our colleagues uh, being kind of experts, or at least considering or understanding. Uh, the importance of gender equality throughout their spe speciality, but it's honestly it's a challenge right now uh, to uh, not putting too much pressure on our colleagues, but making sure that they are spreading their sharing their knowledge uh, and building the capacity throughout the department. But actually, not only throughout the department, because I've I've got some of my good staff, gender equality specialist staff, stolen by my colleague, the Minister of Status of Women. <laughs> and since we had a gender sensitive budget, all of the departments needed gender specialists, and they were at GAC mainly uh, because. So this this is a challenge, but we're working on building capacities. Um, you talked about positive masculinity. Um, a lot of the, 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 the first travel I, I made were more in Africa, Middle East, uh, a lot. So um, this subject didn't come out so often, but when it comes out very strong, it's in the Caribbean. Uh, I, 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 the, the discussion is, is different uh, around the importance of uh, positive masculinity. It's very interesting to see how we have to adapt uh, the, the, the concept uh, on the region where we are because uh, we can see that uh, women empowerment in some countries <laughs> uh, work quite well, but it, it also has a counterbalance in moment impact on, on, mm. on boys and men, and, and yeah. we definitely have to take good care of it. So every, uh, this is why every, everything related to education, directly or indirectly, we have to take into consideration how we work with boys. And actually, uh, uh, like for example, in UNICEF's project, uh, all the, the work that is being done, uh, making sure that uh, UNICEF with all others partners, because you're there, but <laughs> uh, I mean, this is so important for our partners to make sure that throughout any projects they do, they provide positive masculinity uh, mm. mod model for, for boys because it's definitely an issue. If and uh, you raised the fact, uh, the, the, the point of the importance of education in humanitarian context. And obviously, I, I, the, when you talk about it, the first thing I thought of is the, uh, the initiatives uh, No Last Generation because uh, well, I, I was in Jordan twice, in Iraq and Lebanon as well, and, and I've seen the importance of, of this initiative and the, uh, the importance of providing education to, uh, to children in, in these contexts. So yes, definitely putting we need to invest more because it's a matter of uh, developing their capacity to, to, to rebuild their country or to have a positive... Uh, positive learning, positive education, but it's also a matter of stability because we all know that when boys are in the street instead of school, they, they, they have chances to be attracted by, uh, by extremists or any kind of armed group. So this is the safer place for boys to be is definitely in school and same for girls. If we want to avoid child early forced marriages also to keep girls in school. So, um, you can expect the G7 to, to put a special focus on girls' education in crisis environment. So I'll come to other. I think the, if I could just add one footnote to what you were just saying. I mean, it seems to me that there's a, a real challenge not only to make sure that in each of the areas, whether it's health or nutrition or education, that there is a special focus on 
program for adolescent girls, but also that we step back and rethink how would we do the overall program in those areas if we were actually putting women and girls at the center of our thinking? And, and I think that's the, in a way, it's much harder thing to do. And, and I think what, what's nice is that I see is that Canada sort of challenging its partner organizations to also do the latter. To say, well, how would your program look differently? So if you were designing an education program that you wanted to support, how would it look if you were actually designing it, starting from thinking about women and girls as an integral part of it, rather than saying, I have my program, I'm not gonna to touch that, but here I'm going to start a separate uh, small effort, which I can then kind of tick the box and go to Canada on and say, look, here's my uh, program on women and girls, because that will never reach the scale of the issue. And, and I feel that in a way, the, the real challenge for all of our organizations will be to rethink our core work in each of our areas rather than to think of this as an add-on. And, and in a way, it's harder, but mm -hmm. it, without that, we're not going to make the progress that we need. Um, uh, so I'm gonna come to the back and then work back again. So I see right in the last row is the lady over there. And, and then I'm going to come to the two hands over there, there's a gentleman lady there, yeah. And then I'll come back again, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Haney. I work at PwC. Um, I have a question on, so I appreciate the emphasis on financing. I find that a lot of investments can be determined through where the money is. So I just wanted to know more on these innovative financing um, ideas that you had and some of the, the development finance for SDGs, especially in context with the new DFI, the Development Finance Institution being created in the US. Thank you. And then there's a gentleman there and then a lady. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Your comments are very well received in that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Paul Spurs. I'm, I'm director of an organization called Vision Aria Network. Uh, I completely agree that women and girls, adolescent girls, are the most vulnerable and also the most powerful to engage in change making. Um, after asking them myself uh, and through our programs, uh, I see that they're not just interested in issues that affect them. And in the spirit of reducing silos, and also understanding that SDG 5 gender is a cornerstone of other sustainable development goals. I'm wondering if there's an appetite or any focus on how to engage girls in problem solving, not just in issues for them. Uh, yes, thank you. Good, thank you. There's a lady just behind you. Yep, there you go. Hi, thank you very much, Minister. My name is Cindy Drakeman. I'm the CEO of Double X Economy. We're a research firm on women's economic empowerment. Uh, I'm really enthused by what Canada's doing, the leadership it's showing. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of a longer range vision, we've talked a lot about aid and education, but I believe that the average stay in a displaced persons camp is something like 18 plus years, and it's probably longer. So are you considering um, issues of pathways to entrepreneurship, job creation, and more economic growth that would then allow for the, um, the education and the skills that you're developing in these folks to, in fact, be fully engaged. Thank you very much. We take one more question. I think there was a there was a lady right in the back there. I'm just going to hand up there. Yeah. Thank you. Sitting next to Mark. Hi, my name is Mary Mbadi and I work for Emerging Public Leaders. We run a civil service leadership program in Africa. Thank you for your remarks today. I really enjoyed hearing about um, Canada's feminist international policy. My question today is about Canada's um, investment in civil service capacity and building governance capacity across different governments or amongst youth leaders. Um, our program, we believe that public service is at the base of delivery of supporting education efforts, health, and we want to know what Canada is working to improve on this. Okay, all right, four big issues. Okay, innovative financing. Um, well, we're still on the, uh, trying to, work, to be more innovative, but I would say that one great example, recent good example is the WeFi initiative <laughs> uh, that uh, we, we participated with the, with the World Bank. So the idea was in the beginning to get $200 million from a contributing government uh, to 
make accessible to women entrepreneurs in developing countries and then reach uh, a billion dollar investment in, in developing countries. So Canada was an, amongst the first to contribute to this fund with uh, $20 million, but it's already uh, going very, very well. So we were supposed to, our objective was 200 million from donor government. We are at 340 the last time I looked at it. And only the first call for proposal um, I'm looking at Christine, I think it's 1.6 billion uh, already uh, in terms of investment in, uh, in women-run businesses in developing countries. So this is a good initiative where we can use our uh, public money to, to leverage private money and uh, support women entrepreneurs in developing countries. So I'm proud of this one and really look forward to, for the coming um, call for proposal. You talked about the DFI. Uh, in Canada, we, it's, it's new that our DFI that we call FinDev. And uh, if I want to summarize the, uh, the mandate or the, we, we gave them, I, they really have to uh, pay special attention to women economic empowerment. Guess why? <laughs> and uh, also to everything related to climate change. So I think when we... Um, give as a mandate to our in, in financing institution, uh, we, we, we include them in their terms of reference. The fact that they have to take into consideration the specific needs, and, and not only the specific needs, but the, to recognize the, the, power, the, the way that women can be powerful and can you know, uh, lead business and, and, and create wealth in a country is also uh, something we can do in, in our terms of reference with financing institutions. So the FinDev in Canada is designed this way. How to engage girls in um, problem solving? <laughs> Trying to write. Um, I think this is something that we have to, to once again, um, I think I said it earlier, but what we are asking our partners is, if they want to get money from Canada, they have to demonstrate that they consulted women locally, that they were part of the decision making, and then seen as uh, agent of change, not only as and beneficiaries. And we strongly believe that if we empower local women's organization, if we work with local women's organization, uh, it's also a good way to um, to 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 have to, to develop their capacity, to build their capacity, then to be able to to sit on this ta table where the decisions are made and in in um, peace processes as well. So this is why we invested. You might have heard about our Women Voice and Leadership Initiative, 150 million dollars over five years in more or less 30 countries to support local women's organizations. So the idea is really to build local capacities. So they they know how to deal with their governments. They know how to deal with local media. They they know how to get money from different uh, donors. How to how to report according to the, uh, the best practices so they can get this money and also to provide them direct funds so they can, um, they can realize uh, concrete projects in the field within their communities because they are the best place to, to understand it and to make changes uh, in their environment. Um, how to, knowing that the, the the stay in a refugee camp might be but 17 or 18 years. Um, so if absolutely, we have to work on how do we give it a sense to their life because sometimes we're talking about generation in a camp. So it's also, I think, a matter of, of working with the local government, how to integrate refugees in the local economy. Uh, I think it's also a challenge. So, when we when we can get um, once again Jor Jordan is an example for me then and I have to look at UNICEF mm -hmm. when I think about Jordan uh, having children in the same school as the local kids I think it's also a good way to to integrate the two communities the host community and the refugee community together I think it's a it's an asset for the future um, and I, I also know that many of our humanitarian partners are trying to um, 
to find different ways to support the, the refugees uh, and providing cash uh, for work so they can contribute to the local economy, so they can they have little business on the camp. So we have to think about different ways of getting closer to a, a normal life. And it's once again a matter of stability when when adults and and and, and boys and men and you feel that you contribute and you, you can take care of your of your family notwithstanding the special context you are in, also contributes to, to the stability and to creating a peaceful environment. Uh, Mariam, you talked about youth leaders and public services. Um, it made me thought about our inclusive governance um, area of action, but tell me if I don't answer your question uh, correctly. But uh, one of our area of action is to support local government, uh, and I would say it's mainly in the education, health, justice, and revenue department. So, because when I was doing this consultation, asking my counterparts in different countries, okay, tell me what Canada is good at. You've been working with us for 50 years, and I was always told technical assistance. Uh, and I think we can do uh, good things working within departments in developing countries to help them or accompany them uh, designing more inclusive uh, policy laws, programs that uh, would take into consideration the specific needs of different vulnerable groups, including women, LGBTQ community, and, and people living for, with disabilities, for example. Um, so this is something that we want to do to strengthen local public services. Um, for youth, well, obviously, um, we strongly believe that we, we have to empower youth. And, and when, we, when we want to bring the G7 around the particular challenges faced by adolescent girls, it's also an example of, of the importance of uh, taking their particular, looking at them, once again, not as victims, or vulnerable people, but looking at them as agents of change, so investing in them. Thank you very much. So I was just going to say that I think the issue that you raised about the refugees being in now 20, well, it's 18 or 22, depending on which group you're looking at, years that they're, so essentially the, the whole set of needs associated with them changes. It becomes much more kind of development, integration mm. agenda. And, and part of that clearly is education, part of it is economic empowerment. And the Jordan example that you gave is a nice one because we had a conversation here a few weeks ago with Imad Fahuri, uh, mm -hmm. who's the Minister of Planning in Jordan and uh, a few other uh, people talking about the experience of Jordan in implementing these country compacts that have come about. Uh, which are a way for both the donor international community and the countries to kind of make mutual commitments on supporting uh, the integration of the uh, refugees, displaced people in ways that are more than a kind of short-term humanitarian response. And, and now you said you're just back from Cox's Bazar and, and Bangladesh and, and with the Rohingya population there, that's clearly going to be a similar challenge that how do we develop a country compact and I wonder whether, in a way, one role Canada can play in all of these conversations, um, whether it's on the country compacts and humanitarian assistance, or whether it's in looking at the replenishments that are coming up for a lot of concessional financing windows next year, whether it's IDA or, or others, is to keep pushing that agenda of putting women and girls at the center of those, or at, in that conversation, and, and is that something that between you and the finance ministry you see as part of your international uh, agenda as well, to kind of make sure that in all of those conversations, Canada is kind of pushing that? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. when, we, when we work in, uh, with bilateral projects directly with different partners, it's obvious that we, we can be uh, stronger on our on the prerequisite to get Canadian bilateral money. But when we contribute to a, a more global or multilateral fund, 
then we, we count on our Canadian representation on boards uh, to <laughs> some recognize themselves here. Uh, <laughs> we count on them to push, push uh, this agenda further and make sure that it is um, being more than considered, but it is integrated in any type of uh, analysis grid <laughs> yes. to, to support projects. Thank you. I know there are many people who have questions, but I'm also being told by Sarah that we have run out of time because the minister has other commitments. So I want to uh, bring this to a close. I want to thank you, uh, Minister Bibo, for again taking the time to, to share with us your vision and for engaging with all of us in, in this conversation. I want to thank all of you for coming and for raising your perspective. So thank you very much. <laughs>